to the, the panel today is cele celebrating and remembering uh, the life of Mark Levy, a colleague of many of us, and a friend, and a good friend of many of us, and perhaps a teacher to many of us. Uh, and uh, we really want to take this, this time to remember him and share thoughts and reminiscences about him that we have. Um, I want, I, on your seats, just to, so, uh, there's information about a scholarship that's being created in Mark's name. <coughs> take a look at this and take it with you, and if you want to, you want to contribute. Uh, one of the people who's on, who's supposed to be on the panel, Bradley Greenberg, is not able to make it because he's had back surgery, so he, he can't be here today. And uh, we do have some uh, mess message from uh, at least two people who weren't able to make it today. Um, I'm Ed Fink. I'm at the University of Maryland. Actually, for a little while longer, I'm going to be part of the faculty at Temple <coughs> University starting July 1st. And I'll, I want to begin talking a little bit about uh, Mark's life, but I'll I'll let everyone else, I'll let the other people who are uh, speaking talk in more detail about their relationship to Mark and their understanding of his work in, in terms of a scholar and their friendship with Mark. Um, Mark was, uh, was obviously a friend and a scholar and a colleague of mine, but I'll uh, give you some basic information about him. Mark was born June 7th, 1943. He died this past February 7th at the age of 71. <coughs> his, his parents were from <coughs> Philadelphia, they moved, to, they moved to the District of Columbia. Uh, he went to Johns Hopkins University for his bachelor's degree where he majored in political science. He went for his master's degree at, at uh, Rutgers, he got his master's degree in politics. Then he became a reporter <coughs> for a newspaper in New Jersey. He was, a, he was a reporter, a criminal reporter, and he worked for NBC News from 1965 to 1966. Uh, ultimately, he was involved in dealing with elections. He uh, married Diane <coughs> in June 1966. Diane, in 1974, jumping ahead, received a doctorate in French and Romance uh, uh, Philology. He wrote his first book, The Ancient <coughs> Factor. He then worked for Newsweek. He worked for Pat Cadell, dealing with data related to the Carter re-election campaign. And then he went back to the university and got a PhD in sociology from Columbia in 1977. While at Columbia finishing his PhD, he, worked, he taught at Columbia, and then he was an assistant professor briefly at Columbia from about, <coughs> up to 1978. He then taught at State University of New York at Albany, and his uh, first son, Josh, was born in 1977. Um, one of the stories that I could tell you, a very brief story, was you know, Mark had polio as a child, and I'll never forget when he told me when his son, Josh, got a polio vaccination. And he cried. Um, he, be, he began working at the University of Maryland, where he became an associate dean and a full professor. <laughs> His sons, Matt and Joe, were born in 1982. He, taught, he moved to Michigan State in 1999. He was chair of the Department of, Department names keep changing, it was telecommunication and information and other stuff with electricity from 1999 to 2006. He taught in Singapore in 1997 and in 2007. He met there, uh, he met in Singapore Han Yi, who became a student of his and a colleague of his and uh, an honorific son of his and, he, and he, was re he was referred to the family as the, as the fourth son. He has, he had two grandson, he had a grandson and a granddaughter. Um, I'll tell you uh, one, one story that, that encapsulates Mark. And the interesting thing about the story is, I think the story was incredible, and, and uh, Mark didn't remember this story, which, I, which struck me as funny. Uh, in 1987, Mark and I were both being considered for promotion of full professor. And the way it worked at the University of Maryland at that time, the people that were getting promoted would get the information all the same day. Wherever it was on campus, the letter was given out all the same day, which meant that Mark would find out if he got promoted, and I would find out if I got promoted the same day. Well, I didn't know if Mark got promoted, and he didn't know if I got promoted, so neither one of us wanted to call the other. <laughs> because we didn't want to be the, you know, like, I did and you didn't kind of thing. 
So we waited and waited and waited, and finally, I think Mark called me, and he said, did you get promoted? Yes. He did too. And then he said, I'm going to send you a promotion gift. And I thought that was kind of strange. I didn't I, not a birthday or anniversary, I didn't know what a promotion gift for a full professor would be. And uh, a few days later, I got in one of, you know those campus envelopes with the holes in it? You know those, those, got a campus envelope that was bulky. It was like a bulky campus envelope. And I opened it up, and it was a cut branch from a tree. So I called Mark, and I said, I think I got your gift. <laughs> and he says, do you understand? And I said, no, I don't understand. He said, I want you to know what dead wood is like. <laughs> um, Mark taught not to take academia too seriously. He taught that you have to understand the metaphors of language and write so that people actually understand what you write. That was a new idea, I think. He uh, clearly put family and friends first. He clearly enjoyed life. He enjoyed good food. He enjoyed good wine. He enjoyed good scotch. How much, how much did he enjoy good scotch? After his funeral, by his demand, uh, the family distributed actually, I a PD single malt scotch whiskey. I don't know what that is exactly. Uh, and that was after the funeral. And each of us got a little glass of it because the idea was, would we like it? And I never had had this. And I took a little glass like this, and that was too much for me. <laughs> I, my wife, Deb, went. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wanted to use knowledge to make people better and make society better. He wanted to laugh when possible, love while he was living. He was a curmudgeon of sorts, not in the sense of being a grouchy old person, but a person who does not suffer fools gladly. He didn't tolerate stupidity with others. If they should know better, that is, as a teacher, sometimes you know, the students should know better, you're teaching them. But when people should know better, he found that something hard to deal with. Um, we'll, we'll miss him tremendously. Um, and I'd like to now read uh, something that was submitted by Jay Bloomler at the University of Leeds. He retired at the University of Leeds, but he lives in Leeds. And he sent a, a brief message. I'd like to read his first, this point. He wrote this. Dear friends and admirers of Mark, I suspect that I shall be echoing others' tributes to Mark in two capacities, as a distinguished scholar and as a great guy. He applied sharp, clear, and path-breaking approaches, both theoretical and empirical, to a remarkable range of core issues of communication analysis. These included the notion of audience activity, the problematics of news media's contributions to citizen learning, the impact of globalization on national news provision, and a host of new media developments, video games, virtual reality, and much more. His qualities explain why Mark was in such demand to serve as an editor of leading journals and review yearbooks in our field. But my strongest and warmest impression of Mark is of a truly generous and giving person, available to help with or to talk over one's needs of the moment, whatever they might be. Thus it was Mark who regularly ferried me and my hefty suitcases from and to Dulles Airport during my autumn semester stints at Maryland's College of Journalism in the 1980s. And it was Mark who responded often, patiently and effectively, <coughs> to my technologically illiterate inability to cope with the newfangled instruments of the digital age. In my mind and heart, all that really abides. Uh, Jay Blumler. Okay, now I'd like to introduce Kiva Cohn, very close, apparently, and according to the slide, a brother of Mark for his, his comments. Mark and I go a long way back. Ever since we met, we considered ourselves as non-biological brothers. His grandparents, as uh, Ed said, came to the United States from Russia at the beginning of the 20th century and settled in Philadelphia. His parents moved to the, from, from Philly to the Washington, D.C. area, where Mark grew up as an only child. His father died when he was a young boy. His mother skipped him directly into first grade at age five 
and he attributed his failure to learn how to color inside the lines to this lack of kindergarten. <laughs> On the other hand, Diane, his wife of 49 years, who could not be here today, believes that this, was, this may account for his outside-the-box way of thinking. Mark went to Calvin College, Cal Coolidge High School in Northwest D.C. The <clears throat> D.C. Not, fashionable, not the fashionable part of Northwest. At the time, boys in the D.C. schools had to do cadet training. But in lieu of that, Mark opted for marching band and played the tuba. Can you imagine Mark carrying the tuba? He received his B.A. in political science from Johns Hopkins University and quickly realized he did not want to be a dentist, crushing his mother's dreams. He got a master's degree in public policy at Rutgers at the Eagleton Institute, and then worked as a reporter for the Bergen Record in New Jersey. Mark enjoyed doing that police beat, talking all to all the desk sergeants about the day's crimes. In 1966, Diane and Mark were married, and moved to and Mark moved to NBC as a reporter and producer, but wound up in the election unit, by in which sorry, the election unit, which did the analysis and background coverage so that Huntley and Brinkley could look smart on election night. He left NBC for Newsweek in 1971, spent a year there, and decided to go back to school in order to delve more deeply into the meaning of news. He spent five years at Columbia and received a PhD in sociology in 1977. I believe this I believe that his advisor was Professor Davison, that third person guy, effect guy. <laughs> During his doctoral program, he taught briefly at Columbia, at Columbia's J School. Soon after that, as Mark, <clears throat> so, as, so as you can see, Mark was one of those in his generation who never formally studied communication and knew the newly emerging discipline. But this did not prevent him from becoming a leading scholar in our field. Diane completed her dissertation, her doctoral dissertation at Columbia three years earlier, as Ed said, in French romance and philology. And he was, and she was the first to get a real teaching job at SUNY Albany in 1976. <coughs> Mark was also offered a job there in, soci in the sociology department. In 1979, they moved back to D the DC area where Mark got an offer from the College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, where he spent 20 years. In 1992, Mark was appointed editor <clears throat> of the Journal of Communication, the first person in that position following George Gerbner's seemingly endless term of 17 years. In 1999, Mark was offered a position as chair of the M at MSU's Department of Telecommunications Information studies and media. He served as chair until 2006 and then remained professor until his untimely death this past February. Mark and Diane have three sons. Joshua was born in Albany in 1977 and his twin boys Matthew and Joseph were born in 1982 in Maryland. Mark was especially proud of the twins for good reason. A few years ago Matt received his PhD in economics at UC Berkeley and is now a professor at the London School of Economics. Joe got his PhD in geological science at Brown University and is now at UT Austin. Mark and Diane have three grandchildren. Little Andy. Mm -hmm. Ever since his work in journalism, Mark was fascinated by the process of news production, its content and comprehension by audiences, which became his first major area of research. Some years later, he also became interested in communication technology and was one of the pioneers working on the social aspects of home video. Mark and I collaborated on, in both these areas. In 1996, we published a book together, Global Newsrooms and Local Audiences, a study of the Eurovision News Exchange, with two additional colleagues, Yitzhak Roe and the late Michael Gurevich. The four of us traveled around 11 countries and observed the fascinating operations of that organization. We also did some studies on the use of VCRs in Israel, a country that was a very, a very, very early adapter 
of that technology as well as of that of mobile telephony. <clears throat> in recent years, Mark was engaged in research in India on the use of mobile phones by female entrepreneurs. His last publication with colleagues from Singapore and India appeared online in mobile communication and mobile media and communication just four months ago when, it, when he was already seriously ill. Mark was a wonderful colleague. As I noted, he loved to travel mostly to France, the UK, Israel, and parts of Asia, and mainly Singapore, Burma, Vietnam, and India. In the Levy home in Okemos, Michigan, there is a beautiful collection of art from that region. One of the things he loved the most about travel, in addition to the intellectual stimulation involved in comparative research, which was one of the core, which was at the core of some of some of his activities, was to taste and mostly enjoy the cuisine of other cultures, some of which appear quite strange to the American palate. Of course, he loved matzo balls and chicken soup from his Jewish heritage, but also frog's legs, turtle soup, and various other concoctions. No, he wasn't kosher. <laughs> Finally, Mark had a great sense of humor, often ironic and biting. Many years ago, I suggested to him that we publish a paper by Cohen, Levy, and Israel. For those of you who are not familiar with Jewish history and culture, the Cohens were the priests at the temple in Jerusalem. The Levies were the servants in the temple, and the rest of the congregation were simply referred to as Israel. I thought it would be amusing to have a joint paper by the descendants of three, these three groups, but Mark hesitated. He asked, who would be the Israel person? To which I replied, well, we can give him or her any first name we want, so that those who get the point would smile, but those who won't, it wouldn't matter for them anyway. <laughs> Mark, as a former journal editor, refused, saying it, wouldn't, it would be unethical to do that. So until this day, Google Scholar lists no publication by the illustrious trio of Cohen, Levy, and Israel. A final note, when I retired from Tel Aviv University nearly three years ago, Mark could not come to the conference that was held in my honor. But the organizers did arrange for three brief video uh, greetings. The first was from Mark. One of his antics was to wave a copy of my dissertation in front of the camera written at MSU in 1973 and to say, he actually held it sideways like that, and to say, it looks kind of skimpy. <laughs> it's only 99 pages long. A good size dissertation should be 150 to 200 pages. <laughs> now, is that how one should talk about one's brother? Mm -hmm. Anyway, my family and his spent many mutual visits over the years. The most recent one in Okemos, on the shores of a lovely small lake, which Mark appropriated and aptly named Lake Levy. We miss Mark very much and cherish his memory. May he bear in peace. Links, while I'm talking, I will, I will re-energize this, this uh, slideshow so you, you can go to those photos one more time. Thanks. So, I was on the faculty of Michigan State University when, when Mark uh, became the chair. And I have to say, he and I did not really get along all that well initially. For example, he, he thought that the internet should be totally free, there should be no kind of type of uh, governance of, of the web, it should all be bottom up. I was a little bit more skeptical. Uh, eventually, I think both of us found the way to communicate and, and become uh, good friends and colleagues. And, uh, unfortunately, our roles reversed, and by the time uh, I became the chair, Mark and I were actually initially talking about uh, him retiring so about a year, maybe a year and two months ago, the department chair cannot ask faculty to retire, even if you sometimes would like to. <laughs> uh, but he, so I had to wait until he offered it, and, and that was our, our conversation not so long ago. He, at that time, we had this model of a phased transition into retirement and eventually full <coughs> retirement. And unfortunately, a few months later, he was diagnosed with melanoma, and that was a that was a very tragic and sad battle. And I could see those different stages, uh, how, how whenever a new treatment regime was established and failed again, uh, Mark became more and more ill, and eventually 
uh, had to succumb to the disease. But we do remember Mark for a number of reasons. One is his humor that, you, that, that Akiva just mentioned. And I remember I was already on the faculty then when, uh, when Brett Greenberg, uh, who chaired the search committee, uh, asked Mark whether he would be willing or able to handle the intricacies of an academic department with all the strange characters and all the odds and ends uh, of, of faculty with big egos and inferiority complexes. Mark, actually, who was in, in Asia at that point, and he sent a photograph back uh, of, of him with a big boa constrictor wrapped around his back. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, that photo doesn't, we couldn't, we couldn't locate it. Uh, and, and the note accompanying the photo said, if I can handle this, I can handle the department. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one on, on, in, the, in the slide deck with him looking at a cobra, which uh, may have been another, another example of him training for being the department chair. The other thing that he did is, when uh, Brad Greenberg retired, many of you know that Brad uh, made his name by studying primetime TV, and many, many episodes of primetime TV and many aspects of it. So when Brad retired, Mark would show up in a full body, yellow, bright yellow, Teletubby suit <laughs> <laughs> and give his sort of celebratory talk uh, honoring Brad's career as a Teletubby. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been awfully hard to lose. We also remember Brad, uh, Mark, uh, because of his, of his uh, mentorship to many people, young faculty as well as students. And you know, we remember those moments on, on Lake Levy that Akiva just mentioned when uh, new students would be welcome at the beginning of the fall semester. Uh, other events when young faculty would be there and would be mentored and told about uh, how, how to conduct uh, life as a, as a faculty. Part of Mark's philosophy was that research should do good. And I think as, as he matured as, as a faculty member, I think he took this more and more seriously. And his last, his final 10, 15 years of, of, of a research program was explicitly dedicated to that mission. And he started to look into what is known as ICT for D, and the, the, the scholarship uh, that you uh, see on, on your chairs honors that legacy of Mark as a scholar who was interested in how we can use information communication technology to improve the human condition, to empower individuals. And to his credit, he was instrumental in, in elevating this research program away from the, the historical approach that communications had chosen to development. I mean, there's, a, there's quite a number of, 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 of research publications in the 1950s and 60s, or 40s even, about the impacts of radio, the impacts of cable, the impacts of satellites. All those have a, a, a technology deterministic spin to them. And, and, and the initial ICT for the paradigm had the same technology deterministic angle. But I think Mark was one of the, the early researchers who, who then realized that there's other conditions, social conditions, political conditions, cultural conditions that need to be taken into account in this research program. And I saw him uh, in his last research project uh, that was done, funded by the Sherry Blair Foundation in the United Kingdom. I, I, I experienced how he, how he was working on this project and how he then struggled completing it. But he was so determined to finish the project that while he was in like a third phase of cancer treatment already, he, he spent a lot of time finishing the, the report uh, to the Sherry Blair Foundation. Part of it uh, was then published as, as, as was mentioned before in the book. So Mark probably left this lasting legacy of research for good. Uh, with us, and then uh, the scholarship, honestly, this, the scholarship was generously endowed by his family and immediate friends initially, but in the meantime, I think about 30 or uh, 40 people have contributed in addition to the, to the initial endowment of the family. So we will miss Mark, uh, but we will not forget his legacy. Thanks. What I'd like to do is to share a brief anecdote about Mark. Uh, it's an anecdote that tells a lot about mentorship and a lot about uh, his personality and character. It's, a, it's an anecdote that talks a little bit about how I met Mark. And I was a student uh, at, uh, at uh, University of Wisconsin. 
And Mark was an associate professor at, uh, the, at uh, Maryland and a distinguished scholar with many publications. So it was my very first semester as a graduate student. I was, you know, fresh out and I was reading all about active audience theory and I was thinking about this conceptualization of active audience theory that I've been reading about that uh, was part of Mark's work. And uh, looking at it, and also too with sort of a, a background in philosophy and political theory, it struck me that some of the assumptions and the logic of it were flawed. And so in my very first semester and my very first year, I write this term paper about active audience theory, about picking apart these assumptions. And so the paper is done and it had one of those, you know, those titles that students make, you know, it's sort of opposing conceptions of the audience, the, the active and passive hemispheres of mass communication theory. So one of these big titles. So then all of a sudden I found this paper was going to be published in Communication Yearbook. And Margaret McLaughlin at the time had decided to expand these papers <coughs> into a whole section. I was actually kind of horrified. I said, I've written this paper. You know, I, I don't know if I should, I, think I, should, I should share it with the people whose theory I'm critiquing before this thing is published. What do I know? I'm a new student. I don't know shit. It could be wrong. It could be all kinds of things wrong. So I bundled up the paper and I wrote one of those uh, letters that said, you know, uh, as a student might write, you know, I'm sorry this will be published. <laughs> and, but correct me if I'm wrong. And I sent this to the, several of the authors, actually. And I get back this letter from Mark long, gracious letter, and very generous. And it said more or less, you know, kid, you might be right. <laughs> and then, my, I'm going off to ICA for my very first ICA. Mark goes out of his way to greet me there. And to introduce me to ICA, and to being a young scholar. And so he goes out of his way to greet the students, not one of his students, <coughs> not even in his own university, and writes this critical paper. He goes out of his way to greet me. So I saw very much this generosity of spirit. The novice had been writing this paper, and this great generosity of spirit on the part of Mark. And, and it was the beginning, to some degree, of my respect uh, for his graciousness as an individual and a scholar. It was the beginning of a friendship. We went on to write a book together and do lots of work together. And so what started off as trying to be, get a feedback on some early term ended up being a much larger lesson about graciousness of spirit, uh, generosity, <coughs> and openness of mind. And that's a lesson that I try to embody. And, and I hope it's one of the traits that, uh, from Mark that we might uh, carry on as well. Thank you. Good evening. It's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk about someone who made such an impact on the College of Journalism for 20 years. I want to thank Ed for putting the program together and for graciously asking me to say a few words. You know, when he first contacted me, I thought, Mark, yeah, what can I say about Mark? And the first thing that came to mind was not, of course, what he was, an actual powerhouse, but was pizza. <laughs> Why? Because he had a best pizza party every November that uh, we ever had in uh, our college family, and uh, of course uh, our other uh, friends from uh, different divisions of the university attended too. And, uh, we had such fun. I remember one time uh, I was so enthusiastic about getting there that I misread the time, and um, my husband and I got there three hours early. <laughs> and Mark, 
Mark and his wife had had a very bad day because their sewer had overflowed. Oh. And they were in the basement trying to cope with this disaster. And then here are these two people at the door three hours early. Uh, so anyway, they were so nice and they invited us to come in. Fortunately, we, we had enough sense to say, no, we'll come back later. But that was Mark, in a way. You know, Mark had his office um, across the hall from mine uh, for years. He was hired a few years after I uh, came to Maryland in the uh, 70s. He was hired specifically because we had a dean who wanted to um, enhance the intellectual power of the college. And uh, we, we're more or less, and it still are, a professional school, nuts and bolts stuff, and you know, turn out people who are going to get jobs. But uh, the dean saw the need to have someone who could really look at uh, 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 communications uh, from a, uh, more of an intellectual perspective than just how to do things. Uh, and he brought in uh, Mark as an uh, able young assistant professor. And then, of course, Michael Gurevich. And then we would have Jay Bloomler come over and see us from time to time. So um, we had our, um, our glory period there. Anyway, Mark's office was across from mine. And on uh, his door, he had something that I'll never forget. Um, if you aren't in the media, you don't exist. And I didn't quite understand that, but I do now. And I think Mark understood it. Uh, here in this day of social media, when people can't do anything except put pictures of themselves on Facebook, even when they're criminals, <laughs> you know, uh, Mark realized the importance of, uh, of the media as, as, as part of, I think, the extension of the human uh, personality. Um, the last conversation I had with Mark when he was leaving for Michigan State um, was that the Michigan State uh, curriculum was so interesting. He said, well, you know, they're teaching gaming there. And I said, what? Imagine that. Gaming? Electronic games? They're teaching that in university? Well, see, Mark was way ahead of many of us. Uh, it's quite true, as Ed pointed out, he didn't suffer fools uh, lightly. And I'm sure um, uh, many of us, I certainly am in that category, were, were fools compared to Mark because he was so bright, uh, such a gifted person. He was also a very good colleague. And so uh, there are uh, three people who I located around the college who uh, knew Mark, and I'd like to share with you their comments since they're not with us today. But I do want to say, we have a PhD student from Maryland here, and it's so nice of her to come. I think the program that she's in in the college, and we continue to have our PhD program, uh, turn out students we're proud of, like her. Um, I think we owe a lot of that to Mark. Mark was very impatient about um, our PhD program and about our picking uh, really good students for it. Uh, one story he would tell, uh, also something I've never forgotten, um, he talked about when he uh, was defending his dissertation at Columbia University. Uh, and uh, some great professor there, um, he said, was, was eating a pickle while Mark was uh, defending his dissertation. Mark thought that was pretty distasteful, and I do. Uh, Mark wanted us to have uh, some formality in our PhD program and to recognize the importance of it. Uh, and he left a legacy that uh, we, uh, we continue every commencement. We did it yesterday. Uh, when we have our PhD students uh, get their hood, we ask them to say a few words about their dissertations. And that was Mark's idea, that we have the students um, tell the uh, people at commencement something of what they have done. Do let me share with you these uh, comments. Professor Carl St uh, Sessions Steff, who taught with Mark and is, is, is uh, still my colleague at Maryland, said he was intellectually tough to the point of bluntness but it was in the service of producing the best possible work. One of his virtues was that he was genuinely interested in both the daily world of news and the larger horizons of scholarship. 
and that interest carried over into his engagement with colleagues because um, he did like to talk to the people with professional backgrounds in journalism, like Professor Stepp. Now, one who remembers that engagement with colleagues well is Dr. Kathy McAdams, now an emeritus professor at Maryland, who credits Mark with timely assistance and mentoring that fostered her own career. As she put it, I knew of Dr. Levy and had read much of his work prior to arriving as an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. I thought it would be years before I would be worthy of sharing even a brief conversation with him. Oh yeah, most of us were totally awed by him. <laughs> but within a month, he had quizzed up me on my research, listed articles for me to read and discuss, provided suggestions for alternative methodologies. At that point, she was still working on her dissertation, and much more. But their conversations carried, uh, covered the personal as well as the professional. She reminisced that, uh, that uh, she and Mark often talked about their children, public and private schools, learning disabilities, and the challenges of two career families. Over the course of my time on the tenure track, she continued, our family joined his for pizza, get pizza again. He introduced me to fellow scholars in and beyond our department and our campus that I am in touch with to this day. Without Mark Levy's genuine collegial friendship, my time at Maryland might have been short. Yeah, Mark uh, supported her when she came up for tenure too, as I recall. Without his guidance and mentoring, I might not have spent 28 years in a deeply engaging and re remarkable career. Uh, and I'm sorry, and rewarding career. And she, it has been a remarkable career too, Dr. McAdams' case. But uh, I think this shows something about uh, the, the interaction he had uh, with younger colleagues who really needed his help. To his students, Mark was, quote, the embodiment of what a university professor should be, according to Dr. Carol Rogers, a professor of practice at Maryland who was Mark's first PhD student at Maryland, or first uh, dissertation advising. She remembers that Mark came back from an ICA meeting. Oh, Mark was you know, really enthusiastic about ICA, talked about it a lot. Slid a conference paper across his desk and said to me, your dissertation is in this paper. Find it. She said she did. As another example of Mark's caring about her as a student, she recalls that he was on sabbatical in Singapore while she was writing the dissertation. He told her it might take a couple of weeks uh, before he could get back with, uh, to her with comments on drafts that she would send. Now, this is before the days of, uh, of email. Um, but it turned out that he sent these comments back almost by return mail. As she put it, a doctoral student couldn't ask for more. Mark Levy was an intellectual powerhouse. He was funny, warm, and an understanding human being as well. Uh, we missed him at Maryland when he left uh, to go to Michigan State, and uh, his legacy does continue here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ang Ping Hua from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I have uh, uh, some comments from Eddie Hua that I'm going to uh, read. It was an email that was sent out to uh, the, our colleagues, but I thought you all would uh, want to hear. Eddie was the founding dean of my school and uh, had, uh, had invited Mark over uh, to the school. Uh, this is what Eddie says. Mark was a longtime friend of the school. He first came to, <coughs> to the university as a visiting professor in 1997 and later served as the external examiner for two terms, in 1999 and 2000, 2002, and made several visits during the, those years. He was again invited as the Wee Kim Wee visiting professor. Wee Kim Wee uh, was a president of uh, Singapore and was a journalist. He was, uh, Mark was invited as a Wee Kim Wee visiting professor a few years later. Mark was the one who understood and appreciated the challenges we faced and the vision we aspired and gave his support all the time. During my meetings with him over the years, Mark was unfailing in sharing his wise advice, always with the interest of the school in mind. He will be deeply missed. 
Okay, some background on this. Um, uh, when the school was started, because of the sort of the history of Singapore mm -hmm. and how uh, you know we're tough on uh, on censorship, um, Eddie went around visiting as a founding dean, uh, visiting schools to look for exchange opportunities. And I won't mention where he went, but Eddie says that uh, once um, in that, that period, um, in the early days, he went to one school and he was made to wait. He didn't tell me how long he was he waited, but after waiting, the dean told him they wouldn't see him because he was from Singapore. And you can't do communication, journalism, research in Singapore. Uh, so Mark's friendship at the time was really pretty critical in giving uh, Eddie the kind of support to say that, well, you know, you can. You know? And Mark gave advice. Uh, I know he gave um, uh, advice in the time. And I myself approached him um, uh, for advice. And, uh, and Johannes, you want, want to know that when, when um, Mark went to, to, to MSU, and he was in Singapore at the time, and he asked me, he says, I think it's the best telecom department in, in, you know, in in the USA, you know, it means of course in the world, right? In, in, in the USA. And he said, I said, you're asking me, I'm from the telecom department, of course it's the best, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the USA. Mm -hmm. uh, but he really thought it very highly of the faculty, um, and, and, you know, he made it, uh, I think, a collegial place, and then, like, um, uh, Eddie had said, it changed the name several times uh, because of where he saw the trajectory uh, of, the, of the program. Uh, two things that stand out for me uh, about Mark, uh, one was the compassion that he showed. Uh, he told me once, uh, well, we had a, a mentoring session uh, in the school and, you know, when you, when you visited. Uh, so one uh, anecdote that I remember, he says that as editor of the Journal of Communication, he once received a manuscript from a senior professor. We won't mention who that was. Um, and he said the senior professor had misinterpreted the data. And so Mark told him that, you know, hey, you've misinterpreted the data. Uh, and, you know, this goes out, it look pretty bad. I mean, it's a you know, basic kind of thing. And see, the professor really thanked him and said, yeah, you know, Mark, you're right. You know, I, I'm somehow mis misinterpreted it. And I think uh, that kind of surprised many of us. Like, you know, oh, we didn't know the editors did this kind of stuff, right? Catch uh, 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 kind of uh, mistakes. Um, and this point, of course, was how, uh, you know, you try to have collegial atmosphere in, in academia. You know, sort of point out uh, mistakes and catch uh, this kind of thing. So before people get, in, get embarrassed. And as a side note uh, on this point of mentoring, um, this is really a side note, but you guys might remember better than, than other, other, other side notes. He says that when you submit a journal, okay, and there's a change of editorship, submit to the newer journal. Because the, the previous editor will keep all the manuscripts and try to publish the best of that, and a new editor will have no, no, no manuscripts. <laughs> so the new, new editor will more likely, more likely publish your article. Okay, so those of you in that, uh, that, that uh, P&D process, remember, submit to the new editor. <laughs> uh, as many of you said, uh, Mark is dedicated to research, so let me end on just uh, one, one anecdote. I took him to India uh, with Steve Wallman because I had um, links with um, a research center in, in Ahmedabad. Uh, and those of you who've been to India, you know it's a pretty rough place in how they drive. Okay, I, I lived in India for a year uh, on, a, on a sabbatical, and my own driver once drove like, I think of like half a mile against the flow of traffic. <laughs> and I said, why are you doing that? He says, because there's no traffic. <laughs> and because he's worried other cars would come, right? He drove fast, you know? <laughs> so he drove faster than normal against the flow of traffic. So this kind of, you know, kind of crazy way of driving. And so Mark was sitting on the front seat because, you know, of his, his leg. So I put him in the front. And after like the first, you know, we're driving from one place to another, I think to a restaurant, you know? Mark came out and says, I can't sit in front. I have to sit behind. <laughs> okay. So I said, okay, Mark, all right, you sit, in, sit, you know, you sit back. You know, we're kind of crowded, you know, hey, I'll give you more space. You know. And then, lo and behold, as uh, you, you mentioned, he went to India for research. He said, Mark, how can you do research in India? You can't get around. I sit behind, you know. <laughs> um, and and um, Mark's research, as uh, you pointed out, is on um, what we call ICT for the Information Community Technology for Development something in Mumbai and on female entrepreneurship. And I thought that was kind of very interesting uh, because a change uh, in his focus because he was doing uh, you know, reception um, uh, research and then moving on to ICTD. In fact, I spoke to him like, hey, Mark, you sure you want to do this kind of work? It's you know, different, totally different area for, uh, for you. And he got into it in a very serious way. And of course, uh, he, the way it worked was that, um, because I know that the, the model that he was working with, um, uh, he would um, be mentoring a researcher in India to do the research on, on this uh, female entrepreneurship in, in Mumbai. And 
I think he chose it quite deliberately in a sense that uh, in, the, in, in the research you would have some impact on entrepreneurship and on women and you know that, that to me is, is an impact and, and, and I have this uh, point to know that I observe you know that Marx one of, one of those people who really left the, left the world a better place for the rest of us. Hi everybody. Um, I'll be brief. I was thinking about what to say and I just have one little anecdote to share about Mark because I think it's um, fairly illustrative of, of how he was as a, as a scholar and a member of our, our community of scholars. Um, I met Mark in 1999 uh, when he was visiting the school as an uh, external examiner and we got to talking. I knew of his work and, and uh, he knew my advisor and he was interested in talking to me about some of the research uh, related to active audiences and such. And we were talking about his time as editor uh, of the Journal of Communication. And this was shortly after uh, there had been quite a, a brouhaha, for lack of a better word, uh, when he published the Christopher Simpson article on Elizabeth Noel Neumann and her background in history. And we talked about that. I missed the, the panel discussion that was at ICA in 1997. Um, but I, I'd heard about it and was reading up on it and was interested in the debate that was going on. And I talked to Mark, and, and he's, you know, he kind of, you know, a little bit of time had passed, uh, and so some of the heat had kind of diminished, but he took a fair amount of heat for uh, choosing to publish uh, Simpson's work. Um, and, and, you know, there was a, a bit of blowback from some of the, the scholars and, and uh, advocates of Noel Neumann in Germany. And I talked to Mark about it and, and what he meant and, you know, whether this uh, analysis and critique of the spiral of silence, um, what he thought of it. Um, and I've done some research on the spiral of silence, and I, I think about it, and you know, I've looked at this piece, and, and he felt that you know it was an interesting uh, critique to bring up, and that Leo Bogart had mentioned this some time before. Simpson's work went deeper, and he really tried to Simpson tried to um, frame the theory in this kind of uh, uh, historical context, talking about its totalitarian aspects, etc. I talked to Mark about this at great length. I was a junior scholar; he was a senior person coming in to evaluate our program. And it was a a very engaging conversation. And, and I asked him, I said, so what do you think? And he said, well, at the end of the day, I don't really think it affects the theory itself. I don't think it affects the scholarship. And I said, but you went ahead and published it. And he said, yes, because I believe it was a good debate for our community to have. He said, I think that, you know, I don't agree with Simpson necessarily, but as the editor of one of the flagship journals in the field, I think it's incumbent upon us to share unpopular ideas from time to time, to review these things, to talk about them. And I was very impressed by that. And I think he was quite proud of the fact that he was able to bring that to the fore and have this debate. And I thought that was really kind of emblematic of, of who he was as a scholar, that he really cared about ideas and he liked the exchange of ideas and sometimes even unpopular ideas which need to be aired. So that's my, my story about Mark. I also had many wonderful dinners. Every time he came to Singapore, we'd be sure to have him and Diane over for dinner. Um, we both shared a... a, a, a appetite for good food and wine, and it was nice to enjoy that together. Um, the last uh, thing I'll do is just tell you, there's another connection between um, uh, me and Mark, is, is that um, I had a student, a very wonderful student, who was an undergrad, he did his honors thesis with me, and then did his master's with me, uh, and that's Chu Hani. And uh, I introduced him to Mark, and he went on to Michigan State uh, to do his PhD. And he had, I said, there's lots of fabulous people that you can work with there. And I was really fascinated that he was drawn to Mark and, and ICT4D as research. And, and this is uh, what Hani has been doing. He took a job at the UN University. Um, but he really appreciated what Mark and Diane did for him uh, while he was there in East Lansing. And, and Hani sends his regrets. He couldn't be here. He's setting up a, a research uh, operation in Singapore right now. But he put together a short slideshow. And uh, I'd like to show that.
do, it'll be recorded. Thank <laughs> you. Anybody? I'm Sandra Brayman. I hadn't actually uh, expected to speak, but there's a historical point that I think needs to be made. He was very important in my life, though I should mention, because he invited me to be book review editor when he was editor of the Journal of Communication. And for those of you who are younger, that, that was an era in which there was actually one journal, basically. Or you had Journalism Quarterly and the Journal of Communication, that was it. And so I, I understood my responsibility to be finding books and doing reviews. We did 80 reviews a year. Uh, for the entire field, which meant that I was constantly reading and looking at and searching for reviewers by reading their work <laughs> for the entire field. And so when I think back about the things that made me as interdisciplinary as I am, I, I realize I'm thinking about Mark when the impact that opportunity gave me. But the, the historical point that I think should be made, and I didn't have the wit to look up the journal issue, but when he was uh, editor of the journal, um, long before the Association of Internet Researchers got going, he, he made the first, he commissioned people to try to do the first pass at uh, conceptualizing internet studies. And the approaches that were put forward there didn't fully take, although I think they should be revisited now. But I think um, when we talk about his intellectual contributions, that's one point also uh, worth remembering. Um, my name is Jennifer Gregg, and I'm going to I'm an associate professor and department chair at UMass Boston. I was a PhD student at Michigan State, and Brad Greenberg asked me to sit on a search committee as a graduate student representative for a search committee for a new department chair. And number one, I was terrified of Brad Greenberg. <laughs> but when Brad Greenberg asked you to do something, you do it. Um, and it was the first of, of many search committees and got to meet Mark. And I was in the fourth year of my PhD in, in telecom. At the time, we were just called the telecom department. I was in the fourth year of my um, PhD, and my husband and I unexpectedly found ourselves pregnant, and then found out we were pregnant with twin boys. And Mark was such a supportive factor at that time, and um, you know, encouraged me to work on my um, graduate program, but said, you know, your dissertation will wait, but your twins won't. So he was really a an important supportive person. Okay. Hi, my name is Yvette. Um, I was a TA for Mark. Um, we had a really fun class where we spent the whole time watching science fiction movies and discussing them. And through that, um, I got to know him a lot better at a personal level. And although we've said a lot about his scholarship, I kind of really want to emphasize he really encouraged me to um, engage in a lot of kind of um, extracurricular activities, which is very rare and, um, for at the PhD level. And he was very supportive of um, uh, my painting activities. Um, he came to see my painting exhibition. Um, he came to see my sister when she was um, in town giving her violin recital. Um, these are all kind of things that had nothing to do with scholarship, but really showed how supportive um, and loving he was. And um, I'm also very grateful because um, he uh, supported this project that I was doing, looking at um, how uh, social media uh, influences um, how people get news, and that project is um, still going on. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of do him good by finishing up that project. Well, I'd like to thank ICA for making the session available and for assisting us of, in organizing it, and thank the speakers uh, and all of you for being here. I think that uh, Mark was a uh, significant scholar and a, in many ways a hero and great friend, so I appreciate you all being here. And we'll give this to Dee, and she'll enjoy it too. Okay, thank you.